Okay, I think it's about time to get started. Welcome everybody. I'm Cliff Lynch. I'm the director of the Coalition for Networked Information. Um, welcome to this project briefing session uh, for the spring 2020 CNI uh, virtual member meeting. And um, I want to note that this is one of the special late breaking project briefings that we uh, added um, after we moved the meeting virtual. Um, we invited a, a number of um, presentations addressing various aspects of the current crisis and the response to it. And I'm particularly pleased to have this one dealing with Hadi Trust's role in the response. Um, one of the things that I have been hearing consistently from uh, our members is how important this um, role of Hadi Trust's um, response has been to research continuity at many, most of our members. It's been helpful certainly for instructional continuity, but it's been really critical for research continuity. So I'm very, very pleased that Mike Furlow and uh, Sandra McIntyre have um, agreed to come and talk about this, um, this response. Uh, a couple of quick procedural notes. Um, Mike and Sandra will speak and then um, Diane Goldenberg Hart will moderate a Q&A session. There is a Q&A tool at the bottom of your um, screen and please feel free to use that to pose questions at any point uh, during the um, presentation. You don't need to wait till the end, although we'll address them all at the end. Um, I also note that there's a chat box and uh, we'll be putting out a couple of um, URLs in the course of the presentation that may be helpful for people wanting to follow along. Um, we are going to turn off the recording that we're making when we start the Q&A uh, session to allow for uh, um, more uninhibited uh, discussion of um, the issues there. Uh, so um, with that, I think all that's left for me to do is welcome all of those who are joining us and to once again express my thanks to Mike and Sandra for sharing this with us on rather short notice and indeed for all they've done for our community on rather short notice. Uh, and with that, over to you, Mike. All right, great. Thanks so much, Cliff. Uh, we're really glad to be here today and have a chance to talk with you about it. Um, I should note this is the first opportunity that Sandra and I, or really anybody on the team, has had to talk to a general audience about emergency access services. As we'll explain, uh, we've been focusing most of our communications towards our members um, for good reasons, uh, but we'll, we wanted to share with you both what we've been doing and talk a little, talk a little bit about how we've come to make it happen. Uh, I think we have a, a pretty interesting story to tell here this afternoon. Um, so I'm joined this afternoon by Sandra McIntyre, our Director of Services and Operations. And uh, Sandra, do you want to say a few words? Sure, just hello to everyone and how pleased I am to be here representing all the rest of our staff as well. Um, we're going to be covering several things today in our roadmap for our coverage. First, I'll talk a little bit, uh, I'm sorry, Mike will talk a little bit about Hadi Trust. Then I'll talk a little bit about a brief overview of our emergency temporary access service. Then Mike will talk about responding to the COVID-19 emergency, that context that we were operating in back in March. I'll, I'll talk about how we made it happen. And then we'll both talk about the impact externally and internally. And finally, some words about the months ahead. And back to Mike. Okay, great. Um, so I wanted to share, I'm looking at the attendee list uh, here. I think most of you are familiar with Hati Trust, but I did want to just share a few points to set up the, the rest of the conversation this afternoon. Um, on the next slide, you'll see a reminder that uh, it's been just over 15 years since Google announced its intention to partner with five libraries uh, to scan the majority of their collections. And I think at this point, 15 and a half years on, it's, it's sometimes a little bit hard to remember just how much um, controversy was sparked by this activity. The, it was huge news. Um, it was unthinkable in many ways. It generated quite a bit of anger 
even in the library community that I, I think you could summarize as not good enough. Um, but that said, uh, mo moving on to the next slide, the libraries that were working with Google had uh, a plan to work together uh, and actually had, I think, a greater ambition for the use of the material that was going to be scanned than Google did. Uh, we understood that we needed to make particular uses for research and instruction and that we were better uh, tuned to that community and we could provide better service to them by working together. So HathiTrust grew out of a coordinated effort uh, among Google partners. In 2008, we launched uh, with members of the Big Ten, uh, then known as the Committee on Institutional Cooperation and the University of California. And from those 23 members, we've now grown to uh, just over, on the next slide you'll see a little map, uh, 160 members that are supporting and serving 205 campuses around the world. Uh, the majority you can see is concentrated in North America and especially in the United States. That will be significant when I talk about our policy uh, review in a few minutes. Now, since we've come together, um, a lot of our work has focused on collective effort, collective effort uh, to move beyond a strict focus and the initial focus on visual preservation of reformatted materials. Uh, that was our brief to begin with, and a lot of the, all the infrastructure we built to begin with was focused on that. But we understood, and the libraries that founded HathiTrust understood that if we could work together, we could address large-scale challenges for unaddressed needs, including access to users who are blind and print disabled, or to emerging forms of research, such as uh, that could be enabled through text and data mining, or to catalyzing more common or more coordinated work on common problems such as shared print. But the core of what we've done has remained around collections uh, and uh, uh, building out a collection on the next slide. Um, just a quick review of the scale of the collection today. Uh, almost entirely digitized from library collections of uh, published materials in bound form. Uh, over 17, point, almost 17.4 million volumes, digitized books off the shelf, volumes off the shelf, corresponding to 8.9 million titles. The majority of this collection is in copyright. Uh, we talk a lot about that which is not in copyright, but the majority of it is in copyright. Uh, because also we have aggregated this material under certain exceptions in copyright law, not publisher licenses, our excess policies for the collection have been confusing for many people over time. So I wanted just to set the stage for emergency access, uh, that discussion by talking about our usual access to works for members. Um, and just as a summary here, we try to provide the broadest possible access we can to all users. Uh, but for our members, we've uh, reserved certain functionalities. Uh, and uh, everybody can read and can view works that are in the public domain and that are uh, licensed as Creative Commons works. Uh, members have download uh, rights for that material. Everyone can search the collection and uh, determine whether words or phrases are found in particular works. But um, we also have, for print disabled users in our member libraries, a service that allows access to in copyright works upon demand. And the text and data mining services that we have at the Hathi Trust Research Center uh, currently enable uh, uh, researchers to compute on the entirety of the Hathi Trust collection. So initially it was just the public domain materials, but now uh, it is the entirety, including the copyright materials. Until now, that has been the history of our access. Um, and so what I wanted to do now is turn it over to Sandra to talk about what we're doing in the current emergency situation. So in addition to those services, we've now added this emergency temporary access service, and I'm just going to describe it briefly. It provides special access for our member libraries who are under some kind of involuntary, unexpected disruption to their service. Something like a COVID-19 emergency, but it also could include others. And the service allows students, faculty, and staff who are authenticated at that institution to obtain access to the specific digital materials in Hathi Trust that correspond to the physical books that they already have on their shelves in their print collection. And there's a full description online of the service. Let me just run you through a few screenshots of what that looks like. So if someone comes into Hathi Trust homepage and searches for Rachel Carson's Silent Spring, for example, if I unlogged in initially, do um, a catalog search on the title Silent Spring and click search, I come up with um, a brief record here that shows that Hathi Trust has three copies of this. 
but all of them are available only under limited search only access. So someone could search within the work under normal access for words or phrases within the work um, and do other non-consumptive things through a Hathi Trust Research Center, et cetera, under the kinds of accesses that Mike described earlier, but not any reading access within the Hathi Trust Digital Library. But if I log in to this item with my partner institution credentials, and I am at the University of Michigan, so if I were to use my single sign-on to log in, then um, all the ETOS works become visible to me. That is, all the ones that, my, that are on the shelves at the University of Michigan, my host institution, but are also in Hathi Trust. And one of those is Silent Spring. So now I can see temporary access for all of those copies from University of Michigan, University of California, and U University of Minnesota. And I can click on any one of those. I don't have to click the Michigan one for my ETOS temporary access and bring up the full view in our page turner application of the work. And we're using the controls at the top right. I can bring up different views and page through the work or using the slide bar at the bottom, I can advance more rapidly, et cetera. You'll note the orange bar at the top informs me that I have an hour's additional service. I captured this last night um, and that I can return it early if I wish. And I'm able to here work with the item online. But let's talk about some of the aspects of that service and the way that it must that it is offered through ETOS. First, the access is due to an emergency. It has to be an involuntary, temporary disruption to normal operations. And the key thing here is that users cannot access pr the print collection in the normal way. The disruption needs to last longer than a few hours, and um, it, there need to be various controls on it. Secondly, the access is intended to be temporary and it will end when print collection access resumes its normal form. What that will look like, when that will happen, of course, is still uh, up for question for a lot of folks, but we're treating the emergency as if it will eventually end, even though the length of that and the shape of that is, is evolving over time and the need for library services uh, continues to evolve also. And the form of the access takes various form, uh, takes specific forms. First, the users are constrained to those who have an, um, an educational or research mission at the institution. So current faculty, staff, and students, not extended to courtesy users like alumni. The content is restricted, as we said before, to the digitized works that are in Hathi Trust that match the library's print books based on OCLC numbers. This match is subject to various uh, disruptions and confusions over time, as those of you who work with catalog records know, but we do our best to match it on the OCLC number that's in the record. It's provided to us in the print holdings um, and matching that to the OCLC number of the records that we have in Hathi Trust. The type of use is also, is also limited, and this is particular to ETOS because these works are copyrighted. The, view, the work can be viewed online. There's no full book download. The, the number of simultaneous accesses is limited to one user per volume that's held at your institution. So if your library owns three copies, then three users at a time may access it. And the length of access to the work is constrained to 60 minutes. However, that is renewed if the user continues to keep working with it, the renewal is automatic. Um, and the book may be returned early if, it, if the user knows of a need for others to get hold of it. Finally, we have a process for request and activation. So our member libraries have to apply for this by submitting a request form. They have to document the disruption of the service. We retain that documentation. Then how do you trust staff review that request, verify it, ask any clarifying questions to make sure that we understand that indeed the, um, the nature of access at that institution of the print collection meets our requirements and is constrained in the ways that we specify. And then upon approval, we can activate the, the institution's users in Hathi Trust systems. And that means that authenticated users can have that emergency access. So back to Mike to talk about how we responded to the emergency. Um, thanks, Sandra. So of course, the main way we responded to the emergency was to develop and launch the emergency access service. But I wanted to talk a little bit about the process by which we did that. Um, and I wanna start with trying to remember what it was like to be in higher education in March. Um, I think most of us can probably look back over the last couple of months and identify 
um, specific moments where we underwent a shift in our thinking about how the coronavirus situation was going to play out. On March 6th, which was a Friday, the University of Washington announced that it was going to discontinue its in-person classes for the remainder of that quarter and that the next quarter was in doubt. Um, that was a big deal. I think that a lot of us had anticipated that, but it was still, um, it was still new. Um, for me, I understood that everything was changing and like the whole world was changing when I heard the National Basketball Association was canceling its season. Right When that happened, I knew we were all in for a long haul on this. Um, so over that early part of March, uh, the idea of closing libraries went from an unthinkable proposition to an exception to a rallying cry, really, for safety, uh, to a widespread reality. Um, and during that period, we at Hockey Trust were making, you know, looking at this as if, well, if, we, if the students and the faculty cannot go to the library, what can we do to bring the library to those individuals? So we began developing this service and we started initially with a, um, you know, the intent was to develop something that was gonna be thoughtful and careful and secure, uh, and one especially that would hold muster under public policy and law. And so we worked really closely uh, and at length with the University of Michigan, our host institution, uh, because this was an unprecedented situation. It was an unprecedented response we were, we were uh, rolling out here. In the past, we had contemplated but never executed access to copyright works in the manner we're, we were now planning for. Um, and our intent here was to, as far as possible, parallel the use of print collections. Our intent was not to give users new functionalities that they never had before or access to material they didn't ordinarily have. The idea here is we're trying to, in some way, some meager way, uh, substitute for their library, um, which is no longer proximate to them, and even if it is, it's probably closed. Um, so uh, I will say that Michigan has been extraordinarily helpful in working through this policy. They've never been anything but supportive and enthusiastic about the service throughout the entire institution. Um, but because we are in the United States uh, and are on U.S. soil and subject to U.S. copyright law, we started with U.S. law and under trying to understand what exceptions we could employ under the law to provide access to library collections. So, um, of course, the we could look at 108, Section 108, but we also looked at Section 107 in particular for fair use analysis. Um, and we made the determination that we needed to focus on uses within U.S. higher education and then potentially expand where we were providing access. And of course, you know that under fair use, um, there are four factors that you evaluate uh, the use in which you're contemplating to making, and then uh, you're, you attempt to weigh those four factors in understanding whether the use you want to make is fair. We relied really heavily in our analysis on the first and the fourth factors. Um, we understood that what we were doing was trying to ensure continuity of instruction and continuity of research, uh, and thus we would limit the universe of users very uh, accordingly to students, faculty, and staff at higher education institutions, and to start with in the U.S. Um, secondly, to consider uh, the fourth and, and the fourth factor, considering market effect, um, we made the determination that we needed to limit redistribution and reproduction of copies, and, and it's always we could. So we were not enabling, we were not going to enable users to make a copy and take away. Although throughout the development of the service and even today, we are using words like checkout. Um, we're doing that more as a convenience because it's the only language we tend to have and it's a model or as a metaphor really, but we're really not lending books. We're providing access to books on screen and users have the opportunity to read it on screen in a limited way. Now, we launched on March 31st using uh, for US institutions. On the next slide, um, I want to talk a little bit about our analysis outside of the United States, which was a lot more complicated for us. We understood that fair dealing might apply uh, and might support some of the uses we were planning to make and those we were making in the United States. Uh, but what we also knew is that being expert, being expert in U.S. law, uh, as some of our colleagues are, does not mean we're expert in Canadian or uh, Australian or New Zealand law and fair dealing um, uh, you know might be around in a lot of different copyright jurisdictions but it varies significantly from jurisdiction to jurisdiction it tends to be more proscriptive and less flexible um, in each jurisdiction there are many different other uh, other factors at play like licensing regimes that come into play uh, in considering whether fair dealing will apply 
Um, and we began to realize as we talked with international libraries that the service as we had designed it may not fit all such situations. But it was understood that in some situations, uh, fair dealing could apply. Um, but what we decided we had to do though was uh, because we're not experts, we needed to rely on those members to take the responsibility for assessing the lawfulness in their jurisdiction, uh, verifying that they have done so. And so we had to add an extra step to our process uh, of review, asking them to submit a signed document uh, that we could countersign uh, certifying this. Um, to date, we have a small number of institutions activated outside of the US. I think it's about eight. Um, of course, the majority of our members are in the US, so we would expect it to be um, uh, significantly higher there. But I can say the majority of our members outside of the US do have uh, emergency access uh, at this point. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to Sandra now to talk a little bit more you know, about how we went from policy development to actual implementation. Right, how we made it happen. Well, we had a pretty aggressive timeline, as you might imagine, as the COVID emergency came into clearer and clearer focus for all of our institutions. And I, I took a look at the first four weeks to kind of break this down. We started talking about this with the University of Michigan on Friday, March 6th. And by Friday, April 3rd, four weeks later, we had 118 um, of our organizations activated with the service. So it took us a few days to decide that we could move forward, that we had enough code and structure in place that this was something we could reasonably do by March 10th. And we had a meeting that day with folks at the University of Michigan, and it looked like the policy could go forward, that it would take some time to develop, but that we could work on it. By the end of that week, we established ad hoc teams, more on that in a few minutes. And by the following week, we were able to start internal testing of systems and, app and applications because we were building off of some code that we had originally created for another purpose. Uh, we did have a leg up on that. Um, and then the next week we looked at our request and activation process because each institution is activated separately and we had to assess the situation on the ground at that institution in terms of access to the print collection locally. We needed a, a request process that really worked quickly for us that, but that was a thorough one with uh, multiple eyes on the situation. So we piloted that and then on the following week, March 30th and 31st, we activated the pilot institutions and uh, looked for any bugs and any problems that we had there. Immediately went into being able to accept requests from other members and on April 1st started approving them, added another 25 that day, and by the end of that week we're up to 118. So it was an accelerated process and we learned a lot from it and we'll talk about that more in a few minutes. We now today have 171 different institutions that have been approved and activated and are using the service. We weren't able to approve a couple of member libraries because uh, they couldn't meet our criteria at this time. And we had a handful of requests from non-members. A couple of those are applying for membership now and we're working with them as fast as we can to get them to become members. We set up ad hoc teams six of them, here they are, policy development, messaging and communication, member support and activation, user support, systems and applications, and overlap data and local discovery under the overall coordination of Mike Furlow with assistance from me. We have um, a, a lot of work that we had to do in each of these areas. In other words, it went beyond a development project into one that really had to look at the entire process for activation. And I wanna give some credit to all the folks who participated You'll note that many of our team members participated in more than one team, many of our core team members at Hathi Trust. Um, so our policy development team worked out what, we, what were the terms of this, how are we justifying it under fair use, where would we be um, applying different terms of use, uh, and what would be our con con conditions for continuation of the service. And that um, was Mike Furlow and myself meeting with uh, Jack Bernard from General Counsel's Office at the University of Michigan, James Hilton, the Dean and Associate Provost at the University of Michigan, and Morris York, as, uh, AUL for uh, Library IT at Michigan. And then we had our messaging and communications team, which did a huge amount of work over the intensive time that we did communications with our members, as well as providing support for our website work. 
our member support and service activation team, who were the real heroes during the activation phase of this project, working long hours to make sure that we could get as many members as possible every day activated. And um, then we had our user support team, which is an extension of the user support work that we do all the time, led by Angelina Zaitsev. But in this case, there were additional templates and standard language that needed to be created, additional training that had to be done for our user support team, which is composed of folks from different institutions in the Hathi Trust Network. Then our systems and applications team, led by Aaron Elkis, worked on the code and the documenting of the code and um, the authentication and authorization work. And then finally, our overlap data and local discovery team under Heather Welton's leadership worked on all of the things that were involved in implementing the work uh, locally to integrate with local catalogs to understand how print holdings data affected the service and to optimize those. Finally, we had a, a testing team, which included many of the above folks, and in addition, some folks from the University of Michigan who jumped in to make sure we were getting some fresh eyes on whether this service was working the way it needed to work. So a lot of people were involved, and keep in mind that all of these folks were moving home and working from home um, during this time and adjusting to having children at home and other matters during the early days of the COVID emergency. Nonetheless, we were able to to establish a rapid development process. We um, adopted stand-up meetings daily of the whole team. We used BlueJeans web conferencing for that. And we went with lightweight documentation and confluence in Google Drive. We set up project charters for each of the teams to make sure we articulated what each team was responsible to do, what their deliverables would be. And since they were all working in parallel and were on top of each other, uh, we set up extensive team communication in dedicated channels in our already existing Slack workspace. We set up ex external communications with members over the entire uh, length of the project. There were early presentations by Mike and messages going out to members because we had lots of folks curious right away with what Hottie Trust was planning to do and how we would do it. We started changing things on our website. We provided full documentation there of everything that we were doing and a lot of help with promotional materials so that folks could do promotion locally and help users locally, as well as the user support that we were providing. We had a tracking system for our requests as they came in and asked for a single contact at each library to speed communications and asked that single contact to disseminate information to the library. We developed procedures for members to use with the kinds of reports that we were offering them, overlap reports and usage reports. And finally, we set up virtual support office hours, five sessions over several weeks where folks could come in and ask us questions, find out what else they could do to optimize the service. Our terms of service um, go on for a, a, a good long web page, but here are a couple of highlights of them. Uh, the hardest one for folks was our term that requested that they do no lending of print books or serials that are accessible as digitized works in Hathi Trust. And this goes back to the nature of the fair use, the nature of the service itself. We needed to ask them to suspend any curbside delivery or any document delivery to offices or homes. Um, the service is provided as is and at, at Hathi Trust's um, discretion. We couldn't accommodate any customization requests from specific libraries. And we made it clear to folks that we need to know about their status in terms of the services that they're offering as they resume some services in the coming months we need to know about the nature of the, the resumption of those services and then we worked with folks to optimize the service at the local level because the service is based on print holdings data as submitted to hottie trust we did have requests from members to resubmit their holding da holdings data to update what they indeed hold on their shelves and uh, we're currently doing that process continuing to do that process once a month and um, we, we worked with them on multiple methods for how to integrate the ETOS records into their catalog and indeed other records, Hathi Trust records, if they hadn't already done that, into their local catalogs. That could be done either directly using the overlap reports that we provide and our Hathi files of metadata or via settings in some vendor tools. And we continue to work with vendors to discover additional ways to make that happen. We worked with folks to promote the service to their users. And we're now getting out analytics reports to show them how the service is being used locally. And now I'll send it back to Mike for a discussion of impact.
Thanks, Sandra. Um, I want to say uh, that month of March was really intense, and I hope I don't have another month of March like that anytime soon. Uh, I'm glad for what we did, and the team that did it was amazing. Uh, but it was um, it was hard, <laughs> just to be honest with you. Um, let, I don't want to dwell on that. Actually, I want to talk about impact here. And um, if, on the next slide, um, I have a very busy uh, set of graphics here. Um, I wanted to give a little bit of a view of how the extent of the usage of the, of the service so far. Um, these numbers are through close, uh, actually very end of day yesterday, May 17. Um, I would say, you know, it's been a pretty high, it's been trending upward. Uh, it's pretty high. Uh, you know, I think that it is each week, the level of um, uh, level of usage has grown. I think that's likely in, due in part to improved awareness, uh, word of mouth, but also end of semester activity. Uh, we were able to get this launched just in time for um, uh, for like the heavy research period, you know, for upper upperclassmen and graduate students doing their papers, doing their term projects. Um, uh, uh, everybody's also scrambling to move online, and and you know, there's a lot of heavy use in that in this last month or so. If semester activity is then the primary driver, I think we'd expect to see usage start to drop off about now. Um, some universities and colleges are still in a quarter system and they might be teaching into June. Um, I will know, we don't know that yet though. Uh, this past weekend's dip, every weekend there's a dip in usage. Uh, this past weekend it was the greater dip than in previous weekends, but we'll see. Um, we didn't immediately need to do so, but we have since launched, uh, added some additional servers to the pool for web service uh, to support increased demand. That wasn't something we had to do the first couple of days, but within the first couple of weeks, we needed to do that. Um, now, the numbers I have here are really just high level, you know, metrics, kind of daily counts or, or cumulative counts. We're really eager to dive in and look more deeply at the usage data to understand what materials are being used. Um, where they originate, characteristics of publications that have been accessed by ETOS or under ETOS, uh, and that is doable, but it's something we just need a little bit more time to, to take action on. Um, we've really continued to be on, on the ground uh, with the provision of the service so far. Um, on the next slide, I've got a few stories from users, direct testimony from users here about the impact that the service has had on them. Um, uh, in our user support feedback, uh, in emails, um, you know, on Facebook, uh, by word of mouth, you know, we've seen a lot of an awful lot of appreciation um, from individuals, uh, which is really gratifying. Social media provides ample evidence of usage of the service of a wide range of materials, ranging from uh, studies of Thessaly to Low Rider magazine. Uh, so you know, you never know what's going to get used. Uh, on the next slide, um, I wanted to just highlight a few uh, meta comments or some meta commentary that's been made over the last few weeks. And a lot of folks have observed that the emergency access service is, is, is kind of a realization of value from nearly 20 years of investment in mass digitization. And I think that's absolutely true. Um, you know, just in case activity, uh, the, invest, the investment in just in case activity is somewhat vindicated here, right? Um, the power of collective investments and collective effort uh, has paid off in, in this particular moment. Um, Hathi Trust always made a virtue and a slogan of preservation with access. And this is a moment where future access has, um, you know, unanticipated future access has actually finally uh, been realized, unfortunately. A um, couple of other things I've been thinking about, and we don't have a lot of, um, this is really speculation. Uh, you know, we've known for a long time, it's very easy to invest in long-term collective goods in goodwill and good feeling when the money's flowing. It's less easy to do that when the money is not flowing and we know the next several years are going to be challenging in higher ed and for libraries. Um, I think there are gonna be some important questions on the horizon for all of us to recognize. And one of them is who's going to be able to invest in collective infrastructure and collections? Um, who's going to be able to benefit from those investments? Um, I fully acknowledge right now, we're not able to serve full universe of potential need out there. Um, that would be very challenging for us to do in a way that is consistent, that we believe would be consistent with copyright. Um, but it is a question that really needs a hard investigation and, worth, and it's definitely worth um, exploring. Um, lastly, I just want to talk about some impacts that we're not able to see. Um, there are some things that are unresolved uh, and not addressed through our service. Um, a lot of on-demand need can't be resolved through what we're doing. 
Um, interlibrary loan is not something we've been able to support. Um, and, you know, we're not providing access to copies for redistribution. So unfortunately, that's a that's a that's an impact that we can't really help help with. Similarly, course reserves or multi-user scenarios, we could not really support that in, in, in what we're doing here. So um, you know, I'm really proud, and I think the entire team is extraordinarily proud of what we've been able to accomplish. But I do want to acknowledge it's not what every it's not every need that's out there. And I think collectively we still need to work on some solutions. Um, Sandra, you wanted to say a little bit about what else we've been doing or some other impacts of the service. Sure. I just wanted to talk a little bit about the internal impacts. Um, first of all, this was at a great opportunity cost to us. We had to suspend a lot of previously set priorities. We were just entering a four-month cycle, had just established our priorities for that cycle, and had to table virtually all of it uh, in order to muster our entire resources to uh, dedicate ourselves to creating this in a few weeks. That being said, however, there were some things that became part of the ETOS that actually were, had been on the boards for a little while, and this accelerated our movement towards that. So while we lost the opportunity to work on our website, we were accelerated in the opportunity to work on print holdings and on integration of catalog records for um, local library use. Um, and that continues for us. We have started picking back up on some additional priorities, but we continue to make the ETOS related priorities the highest on our list. We, um, it did, of course, make us work with agile development practices more directly. We had been moving in that direction for a while, but in a, uh, with a small team like Hottie Trust, we often got spread really thin. So we learned how to focus our work in intensely and how to work when there's no defined specification or policy when we first start to work in parallel on all of the different teamwork. Um, to explore, reject some options and explore again. So we hit a few dead ends and backed out quickly and tried something else. And then as always, we saw the value of working with a small scale pilot, both in the um, processing of the requests and in the um, activation of the service itself at, at several institutions. And I just want to echo what Mike said earlier about how, how important this was to staff and how important it was to the, this project that we had staff resilience, that we had a team in place working well together, um, caring a lot about providing this service and um, willing to keep coordinating and making it happen. We did also have to pay a lot of attention to maintaining that resilience and make sure that some of the communication we were doing was about the troubles that people were experiencing personally in their lives and to make sure to balance out that and to support each other as much as we possibly could during this time. Okay, so we're coming up on the close and I wanted uh, to close by talking a little bit about the months ahead and how we think about the service today compared maybe with a couple months ago. Um, on the next slide, you know, a few, a few things to highlight here. Um, we've received some messages, we've we're receiving a lot of questions from folks these days about how the service will be provided or whether or not it can continue to be provided. And I'll just say right now, we're still working on some guidance that we will distribute uh, soon, but I can say a few general things today. Um, first thing is to remind you, we're responding to needs in an emergency. We did not set a date for the end of this service. Um, in many ways, we've been through the easy part of, of developing the service. And in fact, I think in higher education, in some ways, we've been through the easy part. Hard as hell to shut down our campuses, but figuring out how to be um, responsive to public health varying public health situations across a very large geographic spread is going to be really challenging. Um, 171 libraries currently have access to the service. They're all looking at how they provide their own local response continuing uh, in the crisis. And it's worth acknowledging none of us know with any degree of certainty how we're going to be operating in the fall. Um, at all of our institutions, I think there's parallel planning for providing both online instruction and in-person instruction there's likely to be a very broad mix of that. Um, we're starting to see institutions struggle with re-entry to labs and maintaining research continuity in the sciences now. Um, in our libraries, I feel like we're often left waiting for guidance. Um, as a case in point, the American College Health Association issued on May 7th some guidelines titled Considerations for Reopening Institutions of Higher Education in the COVID-19 Era. It offered guidance on housing, dining, and athletics, among other things, it never mentioned libraries once, not a single time. So, you know, libraries are, are, are working together to figure out what they can do and need to be doing without a lot of attention from the outside, unfortunately. 
Um, I think it's safe to say that where services can be left online or will be moved online, they will be. Um, and that when libraries begin to open their doors, it's going to be with limited staff with reduced occupancy levels and uh, potentially not at first for students and faculty. Um, I wanna come back to something that we say in, the, in our policy, that the nature of the disruption is what matters here. A library has to suffer an involuntary disruption of normal operations. And I wanna emphasize this, the resulting in the fact that users cannot gain access to items in the collection as they ordinarily would. It seems unlikely that many of us are gonna say that we're able to provide access to items in our collections as normal in the coming months. So just to wrap up here, um, I wanna make a couple of final remarks. I mean, I think over the last couple of months, it's made manifest the importance of our reliance upon each other. Um, it's never been clearer to all of us that our collective fates are intertwined. Um, it's true in our personal lives. It's more true in our profession now than ever. So the degree, to the degree that uh, emergency access service continues to be needed, we anticipate providing it. Um, we're going to see some stresses and strains. We rolled this out with a quick launch, um, you know, intending to fix things if it went on long enough, and we're still working on some of those things. It's working uh, fairly well, but, you know, the longer you provide this, I think the more questions people have about certain functionalities and needs. Um, I just want to say we are committed to continuing to work on a responsible provision of a solution to an ongoing emergency. Our members who have this service are relying on it, and we're relying on them to help us understand how their situations are changing, how their collections are being made available. Um, and with that, I would like to conclude our presentation uh, and the recording, and we'll have some conversation now. Okay, great. Thanks, Mike. Thank you, Sandra.